Greetings and welcome to Union Street Hoops, a podcast dedicated to Valparaiso basketball and the Missouri Valley Conference. I am your host, Paul Oren. You can find me on Twitter at NWI Oren, and you can find Union Street Hoops all over the internet, including Spotify, SoundCloud, Google Pods, and Apple Pods. And I am thankful for all of you who take time out of your day to listen to Union Street Hoops. We've got a fun episode for you today. Spike Albrecht, former Michigan and Purdue basketball player, is going to join us a little bit later on. The Crown Point native is going to talk what it's like to bet on yourself and make it to the highest levels of collegiate basketball. If you remember Spike Albrecht with 17 points in the first half in the 2013 National Championship game that was later vacated, uh, Louisville beating Michigan in that game. Uh, He went on to have uh, two more solid years at Michigan, but he had a hip injury and he ended up redshirting, shutting it down, and then he transferred to Purdue. And uh, Spike is going to join us a little bit later on to talk about Brandon Newman and Sasha I don't, I, I'm going to get his last name wrong, so I'm just going to go with Sasha. Uh, that Brandon and Sasha from Purdue, Valpo will be playing Purdue here on Friday. Uh, two region guys that Valpo recruited heavily, and they both bet on themselves, went to Purdue, sat out a year, and are now starting for the Boilermakers and will be starting on Friday against Valpo. And we look forward to that opportunity to see a couple of guys that I covered in high school and uh, playing at the collegiate ranks. Um, both guys that Valpo went after, and Spike will talk about that a little bit, talk about what it's like to be from the region, and uh, and, and I'm looking forward to that. The first couple games are in the books, and there was some good, and there was a whole lot of bad, and I'm going to talk about the first two games of the year right now, but before I do that, let me would be remiss to tell you or, or not mention the Valparaiso women's basketball team with a 62-59 win over Illinois on Wednesday night, huge win for the Crusaders. Grace White, 17 points, nine rebounds, five assists, and a pair of steals. 16 points for Kerry Weinman, including four three-pointers. Caravan Kempen, the sophomore off the bench with nine points and six rebounds. And then Caitlin Morrison, the redshirt fifth-year senior who has battled all sorts of injuries, nine points, including the presumptive game winner late in the game. A great job from Valpo and Coach Mary Evans beating Illinois. Illinois is not, you know, a great Big Ten team by any stretch, but they're a Big Ten team. And Illinois is filled with players that were recruited higher than Valpo. Valpo's roster is filled with players who never got a look from Illinois. And to go in there, to go into the State Farm Center and to win that game, big, big doings for the Valpo women's basketball team a team that two years ago won eight games in Mary Evans' first year, and then they upped it to 17 games last year and uh, and, and really were, were on path for a postseason berth, either the WNIT or the WBI. They, they certainly had already uh, told the WBI they'd be there if they didn't make the WNIT, and then COVID cut the season short there. Um, this is a team that is on the upswing without question, a big win against Illinois. And they, like the men, will play their next game at Purdue. The women will play at Purdue on Sunday before going to Miami of Ohio next week. And then the home opener is December 12th against Western Michigan. And that will be a uh, that'll be a fun game at the Arc on December 12th. Looking forward to that. So, okay, the first two games are in the books for the Valpo men's basketball team. They started last week Friday at Vanderbilt, a game that I did not go to. I, 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 I wanted to. I thought about it. I went back and forth. This is the game that had been in the works for a long time. Uh, but then Hobart made the uh, Class 4A state football championships at, um, at, at Lucas Oil. And that was a fun opportunity to go down there and cover them, be on the field. I was doing a lot of video stuff during the game, and it just didn't work out to get to Nashville. So what I did was I took back roads home from Indy and I watched the game as I was driving, probably not the safest thing in the world, and tried to sync up the audio with Todd Eichow and, and Brandon Vickery on the call. And, uh, and and so I got a little bit out of that experience, not much, um, difficult to to see what was going on on a small phone while driving 60 miles an hour down the back roads of Indiana. 
Uh, ended up doing my interview with Matt Lodick at the Speedway gas station. I think it is on the corner of 421 and Route 30 in a Wanataw area. And, uh, and yeah, so a, a unique start to the season. Look, Valpo had some chances in that game. And, you know, they were up by five with about six minutes left to go. And things looked good for Valpo. There were some bright spots in the game in which you had Malik McMillan have a great first half, ended up with a team high 18 points. He knocked down four three-pointers. This was the game plan going in. Valpo and the coaching staff thought they would have an opportunity to free Malik up for some looks when you're going against a traditional big man like Melora Brown from Vanderbilt. There's the idea that you're going to be able to get some looks from McMillan from the three-point line. When you see Valpo go against teams with a bigger center, maybe like an Austin Fife or like a Cam Crutwig, I think you might see some three-point opportunities from a guy who can move out to the to the perimeter a little bit. I don't know that you're going to see that in every game. We certainly didn't see it against UIC, and we'll talk about that in a bit. But uh, Malik got some early looks, and he knocked them down, and he, and he played really well in the first half. And then Ben Cricky, who was held scoreless in the first half, he really brought it on in the second half. He had 13 points all in the second half. He had a couple of rebounds, two steals. He really he really played well there. He played with confidence. He played with patience is the word that Matt Lodick used after the game. So Valpo's up late. They're up 59-54, I believe it was, late in the uh, in the in the game. Um, with about uh, yeah, Cricky, fast break from a turnover, hits a shot, and uh, and it's 652 left. They're up, and then then it goes awry for Valpo. DJ Harvey with a three pointer, Abinia, who is a recruit from Bryce Drew, he knocks down a shot. Scotty Pippen, uh, man, he took over the game. He scored uh, what did he score? Six straight points there, four at the free throw line, and then another uh, fast break off a of Donovan Clay turnover. And then Evans, Maxwell Evans, another uh, Bryce Drew recruit, knocks down a three, and it was all over from there. It was a, something like a 16-2 to two run or something for Vanderbilt late in the game. It was the run that, that you wondered if it was going to come, and it, and it did at the, the most inopportune time for Valpo. They rallied, rallied late. You know, they hit a shot at the end, and, and, and so the score, you know, it was a close game. And then it wasn't close. And then 77-71 for the old backdoor cover, if you're into that sort of thing, uh, in Valpo Falls. Scotty Pippen Jr., a Bryce Drew recruit, 25 points, 14 of 14 at the free throw line. Maxwell Evans, another Bryce Drew recruit, 16 points. The Notre Dame transfer, DJ Harvey, with eight points. And uh, and that was in Dylan DeSue, another Bryce Drew recruit, six points, 11 rebounds and two block shots. Valpo going to the free throw line only eight times in the game as opposed to 27 for Vanderbilt. And some of those were late, but but still, uh, Valpo out-rebounded by 10. They had 17 turnovers. Vandy had 19 turnovers. Valpo turned them over some. They had 10 steals, including four from Daniel Sackey and a pair from Ben Cricky. And uh, Valpo had five block shots in the game, two from Donovan Clay and two from Aaron Gordon, who in 28 minutes off the bench played really well. He had six points, eight rebounds, two assists, and a couple of blocks. And I think you're going to see what a healthy Aaron Gordon might look like. And he, you know, he had some injuries throughout the year, but uh, last year. And and if he can be healthy, I think he can be a great spark off the bench. I don't know that Aaron Gordon's ever going to start for Valpo. I think Aaron will be a great great bench player, good spark off the bench. And I think, uh, I think he can bring some energy into that second unit, I think will be important to take a look at there. So that was some of the good from that game. Now taking a look at some of the, uh, well, I also want to point out on, on Daniel Sackey, 6.6 6 assists, four steals, Jerry Stackhouse after the game, calling him one of the, uh, the fastest players that they're going to see, maybe the fastest player that Vanderbilt's going to see all season long. Saki, uh, you know, he had three turnovers uh, in, in the starting lineup, you know, three apiece for Saki, Cricky, and Donovan Clay, four turnovers for Malik McMillan. Uh, the reserves didn't have that many uh, turnovers, just didn't have a lot of time on the floor. Nick Robinson and Aaron Gordon, in a combined 45 minutes, had uh, two turnovers total. And then uh, Lorang, Agnosovic, Good news and Connor Barrett all played uh, relatively sparingly. None of them turned the ball over at all. Um, those those four 
uh, did combine for a couple of assists. So Saki played well after the game. Matt Loddick said, you know, there are some things that Daniel does with his speed that sometimes you question the decision making that's going on, but other times you you realize that it's just from that speed that he's able to get to places very fast. There were a couple times he he got right to the basket and then just because of the length of the guys in the SEC, he kind of would go up for a layup thinking it was there, thinking it was clean, and it wasn't because, again, the length and the speed of those Vanderbilt players as well. Daniel Sackey is going to be fine. I think Sackey, um, you know, I he's got his detractors. There's no question about it. Uh, I think he's going to be a very, very important piece of this team. And I don't, you know, he he's a big, big, he brings a lot of experience. And, and Sackey, I thought, played well against Vanderbilt at times. And, uh, and, and look, you're going to see, you're going to see more of that as, as the year goes on. Donovan Clay, six of 12, missed five, three pointers, made most of his shots inside. Uh, it was four or five from inside the three point line. And you, you know, he had a couple block shots and, and he was plus four against Vanderbilt when he was on the floor in those 31 minutes, they did well. Now, on the flip side of that, Nick Robinson had a forgettable game. 17 minutes, Valpo minus 10 when he was on the floor. He fouled out in 17 minutes. They're going to need him to be able to play minutes. He's going to be the first guy off the bench. He's going to play a lot of point guard when Saki's not in there. Um, and, and I think Robinson's going to be a key, key part of this team. And you see what... You know, he had some health issues last year, too. Back injury, which which put him on the shelf for the rest of the season. And he did not have a good opener. And then maybe the, the, the biggest struggle and the biggest question mark going into the game was what would Sheldon Edwards look like? Became the seventh player in Valpo in the last two decades in Valpo's program to start as a freshman, joining the likes of Alec Peters and... Um, what do we got? Uh, Tavon Walker. I think Parker Hazen was in that group. Um, Sheldon Edwards what, is a guy that Valpo not only has high ho- high hopes for, they have high expectations for. It's one thing to say you got high hopes for a guy. Valpo's got high hopes for Jacob Agnosovic right now. They got high hopes for Connor Barrett eventually that they're going to come in, they're going to do some good things. And we'll get to Connor Barrett when we talk about UIC, who is maybe the lone bright spot in that game. Sheldon Edwards, not only do they have high hopes for him, they have high expectations that he's going to come in and be a volume scorer. You lose Javon Freeman Liberty, and you need, I mean, you lose your scorer. You lose the guy that you get the ball to and say, go get a basket. Now, Donovan Clay can do that. Ben Crickey can do that. Crickey, although a very, very good offensive player, generally takes some time for him to get going inside. Um, Because again, he's patient. He's, he's, very analytical in the way that he's approaching things. Sheldon Edwards, from everything we've heard, is a guy that he's going to get the ball, he's going to go to the basket. Well, he took six three-pointers against Vanderbilt. He can shoot threes. That's one of the things that talked about in, in leading up into the whatever kind of abbreviated preseason Valpo had. He was hitting shots at a, at a high clip from the perimeter. But I think they want to see him go to the basket as well and, and get into space and get to the free throw line. Um, he didn't he didn't get to the line against Vanderbilt, and, and they're going to need to see him do that and play with confidence. And that's the thing. You're a freshman. Your first game, national television, and, and whatever SEC network national television is, is probably the biggest audience a lot of these guys have played in front of in terms of, of television. And, and it, it was a forgettable game for Sheldon Edwards. It really was. You know, he had three assists. He could move the ball, no question. He had five points. He had a rebound. Um, he had a steal. So so a little bit of glimpses there, but uh, it wasn't great. And Valpo, minus 22 when he was on the floor. It was not uh, It was not good. Um, Agnosovic played four and a half minutes, knocked down a three-pointer early on. That's the only stat that he recorded. And Connor Barrett, I didn't even realize he came in the game. He played a minute. He missed a three and uh, he, and he had a foul as well. So those were the those were the freshmen. Good news played. Um, didn't do a whole lot in the, the three minutes he was out there to rebound and assist and, and a couple fouls. Um, so that was that was the Vanderbilt game. So you come away from that thinking there was a chance, right? Fifty nine fifty four late, and then Vanderbilt did what they did. They made a run. Valpo couldn't stop it. Valpo couldn't get anything to fall late. They ran out of gas, and that was what that was. 
I always think about like what's the what's the the big comment from Lodic after the game. I always try to boil it down. Uh, what's what's your initial thought? Um, you know, coming out of it, and I'll share with what he said about UIC in a second. But the initial thought from Vanderbilt from Matt Lodic was, we were good enough to win that game. We ran out of gas. We should have beat that team. We ran out of gas. Not necessarily an excuse, although I guess I'm sure some people will read it as that. I think he pointed out a fact. They ran out of gas. They were dead at the end of that game. And first competitive environment that these guys have played against other than themselves since March. Um, It is what it is. So Valpo is going to go to UIC, a good opportunity for a bounce back. They're going to go play a team that they have beaten 17 straight times. Now, nobody on this roster has beaten UIC, and no one on UIC's roster has lost to Valpo before. So take that for what it is. But the program, Valpo, had beaten UIC 17 straight times. That's what Valpo does. They beat UIC now. And and it, it started in 2009, and it continued all the way through 2016, 2017, when Valpo left the Missouri Valley Conference or excuse me, left the Horizon League for the Missouri Valley Conference. So Valpo comes in, and they come out flat. They're not hitting their shots. And then, and then they get a spark. Then, then you know, they, 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 they get a, a, a moment there where they go up 15-10. They get uh, a shot from uh, McMillan, second chance in there. Siggy Lorang driving layup. And then Robinson with a driving layup as well. They're attacking the basket. You see that the second chance shot in the paint. It was a driving layup for McMillan, a driving layup by Sigurd Lorang, a driving layup by Nick Robinson. It's 15, 10. And you know, it's, it's, it's midway through the first half and things look good. And then they get a stop. Sigurd Lorang comes down 11 or 12 seconds after they get the stop. He shoots up a three pointer early, relatively early in the shot clock. And then it, 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 it falls apart. You know, UIC goes on a run, you know, so it was a 13-2 run for Valpo early. Then it was a 13-2, maybe 15-16-4 run for UIC. And they go in the locker room up nine. It kind of happened really re- happened really fast, up nine. Okay, so you, you imagine Valpo is going to make a, a run to get back in the game. You can't, you can't imagine that, that things are going to go as poorly as, as they did in the first half when they missed all eight of their three pointers. It just, it was, it was a struggle. It was a fast game, only four trips to the free throw line combined in the first half. And then, you know, Valpo comes out and, and they, they don't shoot at the rim. Uh, it's a shot outside the paint. UIC scores. Um, and, and it just goes from there and Valpo cuts it down. They get, they get, to the back, Connor Barrett comes in, knocks down a three pointer. Connor Barrett played good basketball. Um, Valpo cuts it down to three, and it looks good. Uh, you look like you've got some momentum here. And matter of fact, they put he put the freshman in, three freshmen in at the same time, and they get a shot clock violation on UIC uh, right away. And then uh, then they come back, and Mitchell j- knocks down a three pointer that Connor Barrett played what I thought looked like good defense for a second. And then he got into him, knocked down Mitchell. Mitchell hits the three pointer and gets the, and one four point play. Um, Valpo comes on down. Edwards misses a three. Connor Barrett with the rebound. Nick Robinson misses the three. And, uh, and it just, it just goes from there. And, and Valpo then, you know, went a, a couple minutes without scoring and UIC, they, they took advantage of the game. And Tavion Kirk off the bench, 14 points, 14 assists, uh, four players in double figures for UIC. Valpo got Donovan Clay with 12, Ben Creaky with 11. But the, the number to look at here was one of 14 from the three-point line. And another number to look at was Sheldon Edwards, one of seven from the floor. Malik McMillan, one of seven from the floor. It was not a good game. I actually, a, a big Another big number to look at. UIC, 19 assists on 23 made baskets. Valpo had nine assists on 20 made baskets. There, there just wasn't a lot of good ball movement. The offense was was not good. I know that I get, you know, dinged every now and again for 
for uh, for being a, a, a Valpo or a Lodic apologist or anything like that. I'll be the first one to tell you they were awful. It was a bad, bad game by Valpo. It really, really was. And I asked Matt after the game, I said, that w- what happened? And he said, we got beat in every facet of the game. You know, it, everyone uh, saw, I read Twitter, I read the message boards, people are talking about like, what's the excuse this time? I didn't hear any coming from the coach. I didn't hear, and he was the only one that I talked to with, uh, with the way that it was set up. It, there were no players. Um, it's just the, the media availability, which I'll get to all that in a second. But um, I talked to Matt and he said, look, we got uh, we got beat bad. We got beat in every facet of the game. And he said that the message in the locker room after the game was, he said, we as coaches are not the kind of guys that are going to point fingers at anybody. We are the kind of guys that are going to look in the mirror and we're going to figure out how we get better. And then he said, and that's what we want from U.S. players, is look in the mirror and figure out how can we get better. And... It's, and then he said, it starts tomorrow with film. And matter of fact, I'm really excited about this. In the next episode of Union Street Hoops, I'm going to have an interview with Morgan Fifield, the man, one of the managers on the Valpo men's basketball team. And she actually kind of walks us through a little bit of, uh, of what it was like post-UIC loss. Uh, Morgan is, uh, went to Valpo High School. She's been around the area for a long time, grew up going to Valpo basketball games, and is now a manager. And I had a nice talk with her. I was going to do it on this episode, but with Spike Albrecht here, I, I kind of it's, I wanted Morgan to be able to have a standalone opportunity. So the next episode of Union Street Hoops will have uh, kind of a bonus of uh, my my conversation with Morgan. I really think you'll appreciate it. Um, but it, you know, again, so th- they go into film the next day, and we'll see we'll see what the corrections are that will be made. Now, the, the issue is, is that they're going to go play a Purdue team on Friday that looks really good, really good. They got a seven foot four center. Is that what he is? Or, I mean, they got Zach Eddy. The guy's crazy. And they've just got, they've got great athletes. And it's interesting because you've got Brandon Newman and you've got Sasha and you've got guys that Valpo knows and they recruited and they bet on themselves to go higher. And, and and we'll hear from Spike Albrecht here in a little bit. Look, it, it, I, I, I want to tell you how I kind of felt going into this UIC game. I didn't as a, as a reporter and I, you know, and I'm reading, let me back up. I'm reading people talking about how mad they are at, at Valpo and how disgusted they are at the game. And, and this is this is going to be a terrible year and all of that. Look, I get it. Be pissed because it was bad. Like I'm not. There's no sugarcoating. There just isn't. It was bad. I think they'll be okay. I think that. I think you're seeing a lot of bad from a lot of teams. I think Kentucky was bad against Richmond, and then they lose to Kansas. Kentucky is going to be fine at the end of the year, right? And I'm not saying that Valpo's Kentucky. Don't get it twisted. Come on now. What I'm saying is that. I have watched a lot of college basketball over the last week and a half because what the hell else am I going to do right now? And I love college basketball. And what I'm seeing is sloppiness all over the place. Now, some teams aren't. Like, Purdue has been great. They have been excellent. And I think it's a reason why they have looked really, really good in their games. Baylor has looked amazing in their first couple games. Some of these high high teams that have got some consistency, they, they've looked really good. Other teams have not, and Valpo's one of them. That was not a good performance against UIC. Now, when I step back from this, I got to tell you, I didn't, it, I, I'm not putting a lot of stock in, in these early games right now. And part of that is because I was there that was as crazy of an environment that I've ever been at for a basketball game. There were no fans in the stands. And you can joke that it's business as usual at UIC Pavilion because they generally don't have fans there, at least when Valpo would play them at a 3 o'clock in the afternoon on a Saturday Horizon League game or something like that. There'd be a couple hundred people there. Maybe I'm saying there was nobody there. And this is where I give all the credit to UIC 
and I'm going to ding Valpo a little bit. UIC brought juice to the game. They brought energy. They were loud. The bench was loud the entire time. And I was across the, the arena from UIC. I was right by Valpo. I was right across the court from Valpo. I was diagonally across from UIC. They were they were loud. They were yelling. Sometimes a little uh, a little shady about it. You know, I remember Aaron Gordon was going to the free throw line for one of his two free throws, and and he went to shoot it. And one of the UIC, I think, grad assistants or maybe it was a player, I don't know, just yelled at the top of his lungs, and and Aaron <laughs> just looked pissed. And uh, but UIC brought energy. They brought juice. They brought they brought it. And Valpo didn't. And Valpo was quiet, and there, there wasn't a lot of talking. There was a little bit on the court. Malik McMillan talked a lot. Saki talked a lot. Agnosevic talked a lot. Um, I, but there was – you in these games with no fans, you have to bring your own energy. BYOE here. And Valpo didn't do it, and UIC did. And does that mean that that swung the difference of the game? It didn't hurt. It certainly didn't hurt. Um you know, what What? What also swung the difference is Valpo shot 1 of 14 from the three-point line. UIC hit nine three-pointers. That's 24 points. UIC only hit three more shots than Valpo in the game. They just happened to hit eight more three-pointers. And that's what turns into a 16-point win. Valpo could not hit shots from the perimeter. Sheldon Edwards, again, an awful game. And like I said earlier, they're going to need him. He's not going away because they're going to ride this out because they are confident that he is going to be a high-volume scorer for them. They love everything about Sheldon Edwards' game. Sheldon Edwards has played two college games, and it has not gone his way. And they will – I mean, maybe there's maybe they shift things in the lineup. I don't know. You know, I, I'm guessing if you're going to go play at Purdue, maybe you throw Nick Robinson in there. But then what do you do to the kid's confidence if you take him out of the lineup right off the bat? And and you know maybe maybe who the hell cares about his confidence? Maybe maybe you just maybe just go with it and, and say okay we're going to put the senior in here. We need a better start to the game. Sheldon, you come off the bench. I have no idea what they're going to do. I do know that there are a lot of people out there who are frustrated with him right now. You know, fans and, and whatnot. That I think from everything I've heard. Look, I don't. I mean, what, did I watch his high school games? No. Do I do a do, did, do, do I have hours of film study on Sheldon Edwards? No, I don't. I just know that the coaches thought enough of him to bring him here, and they think he's going to be really good. And so I'm, I'm willing to think that he'll be, he'll be hitting some big shots before too long. So I want to go back to the experience. It, you know, every game, I say this, during the National Anthem, I, I pray, I pray. You know, I, I take a moment and I, I ask for a good game. I ask for no injuries and I ask for no overtime. You know, I hope that there's a good story, right? I didn't even care about the game at UIC in that it didn't matter to me what unfolded in 40 minutes on the court. I was just glad to be there. I was thinking the other day, I, I tweeted about this, the, uh, the night before the Missouri Valley Conference title game, a couple of us from the Missouri Valley, uh, you know, reporters and, and and whatnot and staffers, we went to the Ballpark Village in St. Louis. There was a big UFC fight, and I met some of the, the Valley staffers out there, myself and Carl Berner, who does the ESPN, uh, runs the ESPN behind the scenes for uh, for Valpo. We went and uh, we sat down at this table with, with a couple people we knew and a couple strangers. There was a community plate of nachos there. Uh, we just started digging in and, and, you know, we're sharing drinks, having shots, all that. And it was, it was great. And I don't know when that'll ever happen again. The next day was a, was a, was a college basketball game, you know, the Arch Madness title game. And it was amazing. And it was so much fun to be there and the energy and all of that. And then three, four days later, the world shut down and a lot's changed since then, you know, and, and, and let me be clear when I tell you that a, a lot has changed, um, both in the big picture, I mean, a lot of people have died. And so when I tell you that, like, oh, you know, it's 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 frustrating that we've got to do Zoom interviews now. Look, I get the big picture. Probably, you know, big time, I get the big picture. I'm not a COVID denier or anything like that. I wear my mask everywhere I go and, and all of that stuff. I'm here to tell you that it, it 
I didn't even really care about the outcome of this game. And, and look, I don't care as a reporter, right? But I liked the teams that I covered to do well. I wanted the Hobart football team to win. I wanted the Munster volleyball team when they were in the state finals. It's just a better story when that happens. But like, I was just thrilled to be covering a college basketball game. And I know I'm, I'm coming from some area of privilege here. I'm able to go to the games where the fans aren't. So if you're going to take two, three hours out of your night to watch the game, you want to see a good product. I get that. But man, I think back to April when there was nothing on TV. There was just nothing to watch, nothing to do. I remember staying up till 4.30 in the morning to watch Korean baseball because that was the only kind of competition that I could find. Man, I was just thrilled to be in the gym and to hear the bouncing ball and, and all of that. So look, I look, it was a bad performance from Valpo. So if you want to be pissed about that, I get it. And and they're pissed about it. And they'll and they'll work to get better about it. But I was just, man, it was just great to be back in the gym and be at a game. And and again, I know that I'm humble bragging a bit because I got to be there. But it's been great to I I watch Baylor, Illinois last night. God, that was amazing to watch. Just a high level basketball game. Baylor Gonzaga on Saturday. God, sign me up. I don't even I don't even know how many root beers and pretzel rods I'm going to have during that game. It's going to be amazing, right? Valpo at Purdue. It's going to be it's going to be fun, you know. It's, it might not be fun actually if you're Valpo. I, I think Purdue's going to be pretty good, but uh, I don't know. So it was I mean, maybe seventy people in the gym, the players, coaches included. It was a very odd feeling, a very very strange. I didn't really know how to take it, but look, I, it was just man, it was good to be back doing this, you know. It's, it's it is such a weird off season in terms of, uh, you know, I, I hadn't seen these guys really. Actually, after the game, I did see a couple of the players that, you know, they kind of walked by and they said, hi, I haven't seen these guys. I saw Daniel Sackey and Stephen Helm at Tower Park in July. I saw Aaron Gordon and Nick Robinson moving into their apartment once when I went over to Thrive Nutrition at one point. But all these other guys, I hadn't seen them ever. I never met the freshmen. So it was just great to be there. And, and see these guys. And it was great to listen to Todd on Friday and uh, and watch the game. It was just, it felt like a little bit of normalcy. And Valpo trying to come back from a double-digit deficit and Valpo missing every three-pointer they take, that felt like a little bit of normalcy as well. So uh, the good thing about game two is that uh, that there's more to go in theory. Knock on, knock on whatever wood you want to. I'll also say this, don't sleep on UIC. That team's good. They got another guy, Maurice Commander, who is a, who's a transfer, who his, his father passed away recently, and so he's been out the first couple games. But when he gets there, he's going to be a player too. That team's good. Luke Yaklich is a good, good coach, and he's got him excited. He's got him buying in right off the bat. That's going to be a good team in the Horizon League, I think. And uh, it doesn't surprise me that they were able to put together a good, good game against Valpo. I think Valpo's got to bring energy to the game. Now they're going to they're going to have a tough opportunity at Purdue and then they might be able to right the ship at home against Judson. And and that's that's just one where you know, maybe you get some of that confidence back. Look for Sheldon Edwards to play a lot of minutes in that game to get his confidence going or whatever that might be. And it it it's early. I know it's early. You're seeing some of the same problems you saw last year. I get it. Uh, but I do think that, uh, man, it was just good to be back in the gym. Good to be seeing basketball again. Good to be having these conversations. In the grand scheme of things, with everything that's been going on in the world, if the biggest thing we can be pissed at right now is terrible ball rotation and bad three-point shooting and not being aggressive and getting to the line and then and then somehow missing every damn free throw that's taken... I think we're doing okay, right? Uh, look, just some perspective from me. What do I know? I tweet at Miley Cyrus. She favorites it, and my tweets blow up. It's it's crazy. Okay, um, Valpo at Purdue on Friday. Don't really know what to expect uh, in terms of the atmosphere. Again, uh, I don't I don't know if they're gonna. I don't think they're gonna have any fans there, um, but there will be some guys from the region in attendance. And for that, I want to bring in Spike Albrecht again, who I think Spike will have a unique unique background a little bit to talk about uh, coming up through the region and what it's like to to really bet on yourself. Valpo fans might 
feel a little bit of frustration when they hear that Valpo apparently didn't offer Spike Albrecht. And, uh, and, and he says that if they had, he'd have been a crusader. And uh, it never happened when he was in high school. So um, interesting. So here's Spike Albrecht, and I will see you all early next week. Morgan Fifield will join Union Street Hoops, and we will break down the Purdue and the Judson games. Take care, everybody. Thrilled to be joined by one of the favorite sons of the region, Spike Albrecht. Spike, thanks for joining Union Street Hoops, a podcast about Valpo basketball, but Valpo's playing Purdue, and you have some experience with them. How are you? First off, how are you doing? How, how is life kind of post-pandemic a little bit? Yeah, I'm doing great. You know, life is going well. Um, you know, just trying to stay healthy, stay busy. Um, I know it's crazy times, but I'm just trying to make the most, uh, most out of it while I can. I say post-pandemic, although we're in the middle of it, but basketball's back, so it feels like we've got something positive going on. I want to get to what you're doing in a little bit. You've got these great videos that you're doing online. You've had quite the journey since the middle of June, which we'll touch on in a bit. But, uh, you know, I was thinking the other day, I was like, okay, Valpo's going to play Purdue. Purdue's got these two guys from the region, Brandon and Sasha, which Valpo heavily recruited. And they bet on themselves. And I thought, God, I want to talk to somebody, Novak or, or you or, mm-hmm. or somebody from the region who bet on themselves. And then I was on Twitter and I was scrolling through and you actually tweeted out, bet on yourself. <laughs> and I was like, well, it, it, it was always bet on yourself. And I thought, well, hell, I got to reach out to you. So um, For sure. Brandon and Sasha, you tweeted about them the other day too. They, I mean, they were so good the other night. Uh, these are guys that that VU wanted. They went to Purdue. They sat for a year. Now they're in the starting lineup. Can you talk to me about what it's like to be a region player that bets on themselves to say, you know what, I want to go to the highest level that I possibly can? Yeah, I think, you know, I think being from the region, um, you know, in comparison to the rest of the state of Indiana, you always have a little bit of a chip on your shoulder. Um because I think the state is a little bit biased, you know, more towards the players down south than in Indianapolis. And don't get me wrong, they're really, you know, they're really good players down there. But I feel like we've got some great hoopers up here in northwest Indiana, um, you know, who may not just get the, the same respect as the rest of the state. You know, so like guys you mentioned earlier, Zach Novak, myself, um, I think Sasha and Brandon are, are two more examples of that. Um, you know, so I just think having that constant belief and, you know, knowing – that you can play at the highest level and one to prove to, you know, not only the rest of the people in the state of Indiana, but throughout the country that, that we've got some real players around here. And, and I think you're seeing that with, with those guys at Purdue. I want to ask a potentially awkward question that I don't want to put you in an odd position, but I, I think you'll understand the question. I've been covering Valpo basketball now for 20 some years. And there have been some guys, some local guys that have come to about Greg Tonegal, um, sure. who, I, who I imagine as a young kid, you probably paid attention to a little bit Absolutely. Uh, the from Merrillville right now, Malik McMillan. But I think about the higher guys, right? I'm thinking Robbie Hummel and Scott Martin, they were close to coming to VU. They went to Purdue and, and Scott went to Notre Dame. Um, you again, Zach, Zach was a great example of someone that Valpo went after. They tried to get and then the perfect situation opened up with Beeline offering them a scholarship. Is VU appealing to region guys, or is it really the, hey, I want to go shine on the biggest stage possible? Just your thoughts on, on, on maybe staying home versus going away. Yeah, you know, I mean, I definitely think it's appealing. You know, I'll be honest, those guys you mentioned earlier were in a different conversation than me, the Robbie Hummels, Etwan, you know, they had much bigger offers. Um, I'll be honest, you know, when I was coming out of high school, when I was a senior, if Valparaiso would have offered me, I would have taken it. Um, you know, obviously, for, maybe fortunately they didn't because it worked out pretty well for me. we got to um, find a time machine and go back and, and get yeah, them to yeah. offer you. What's going on here? Yeah, no, it's, it's okay, man. Every, everything happens for a reason. Um, but, yeah, I think, I think kids here in Northwest Indiana, they love hoops. Um, you know, and I think, you know, the people love basketball around here. Um, so I think if you have an opportunity to play, you know, in your hometown, right in the backyard, I definitely think it's appealing, you know. Um, and as I think as they continue to improve facilities and, you know, upgrade and things like that, which I hear are in the works, you know, I think that will only help in terms of recruiting because, um, you know, that's, that's a big piece of it as well. 
we had, uh, you and I had the, the chance to go to the Porter County Conference uh, banquet. It was a year ago. It feels like it was two decades ago. Um, <laughs> but you, you talk to the kids there about this idea of, of you know, betting on yourself. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was a great speech. And I, I just, I loved every word of it. Um, as somebody who has been a closet Michigan fan for most of my life, I've got an autographed Jalen Rose poster uh, picture behind me. See it. Uh, Let's go. The Fab Five is actually what got me into college basketball. I'm, I'm dating myself a bit, but um, you know, when when you look at guys like Sasha and Brandon, who, I mean, they 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 knew they'd have to sit a year. What what do you think was their mentality of saying, you know what, I'm going to go in a situation and I'm gonna I'm gonna just work my ass off to get better to maybe you know contribute and here's Brandon as a freshman now as a redshirt freshman starting when we we're not sure how many minutes he'd get this year yeah he's, he's playing extremely well both of them um I don't know Brandon you know personally um I've heard he's a great kid he obviously works really hard coming from Velpo I'm sure he's well coached um I know they, they love him at Purdue but Sasha I do know really well our families are close family friends um, and I was pushing for him hard when I was there in my fifth year. Um, I really wanted Purdue to, to recruit him and offer him. Because um, Sasha's the type of kid that you want to recruit. He's going to come in. He's going to work his tail off. He's a great kid. He's not going to cause any problems. Um, you know, he's going he's gonna to do well in school, all that stuff. And I just remember talking to him and, you know, with the idea of possibly redshirting and sitting that first year. I was like, that's, that's best case scenario, man. You get a free year, you know, to train, develop your body, get bigger, stronger, better. You know, and then you keep taking classes, get your degree in three or four years. And then if you're there for another year, great. If not, I think Sasha will have an opportunity to go play professionally and make money. Um, but he came in, he came in with a great mindset, you know, and I think that's why you're seeing the progressions he's made each year um, and why he's having the success he's having. It's interesting. I think about your Michigan team that had you and Mitch and Robinson, Glenn and, uh, in the region connection there, I think of Purdue, they've got a region connection. Drake, their basketball team, which just went to Kansas State and won a game, they've got like five or six guys from the region. Yeah. What's the bond like when you're together with other region guys in the locker room? Oh, it was, I mean, I can only speak from my experience at, at Michigan with, with Glenn and Mitch, um, but it was unbelievable. You know, I mean, you have, you know, your whole, your whole area back home rooting for you, cheering from you. You know, especially here when we went to Michigan, most people are Indiana or Purdue fans, you know, or, or Notre Dame here in the state. But like I had so many people coming up to me like, man, we were rooting for you guys. You know, we were, we were watching every game and stuff like that's cool when you come back home and, you know, you got family and friends who, who you know are cheering for you and supporting you. Um, but at the same time, when you're there, you know, we felt like we had a little bit of an edge like, hey, like we're at Michigan. We're three dudes from the region who maybe, you know, people didn't know about a few years ago. Um, it's like, we want to go show that, you know, we got guys who can play. So you had an interesting summer. Um, you joined Louisville staff for a minute. Louisville, sure. <laughs> obviously the team that, according to some NCAA records, you played in the national title game. Um, <laughs> some people would tell you that that didn't happen, but you did. Uh, and then, so you went did that for a couple months and but then you stepped away because you're doing these great zoom videos just talk to me about your journey uh, really i mean i know that we talked in january of 19 you were doing medical stuff and things like that but but talk to me about your itch to get back into basketball and where that's taken you over the last year and a half or so yeah basketball is definitely my passion um and i just i love being around the game i tell people all the time like the game of basketball literally changed my life um you know going to going to northfield mount herman then michigan and Purdue, the relationships I've built, the people I've met, the position it's put me into now where, you know, I can kind of just do what I want with this skills training. You know, I don't have any, you know, a school debt or any student loans, which is huge. So, um, like I said before, it's literally changed my life. Um, and I wanted to stay connected to hoops somehow. I thought it was coaching. So I went the traditional route and was a graduate assistant at Louisville for the past, you know, four or five months. Um, but I got there and just, you know, kind of learned pretty quickly that, you know, the, the thing I like most about basketball is just working guys out, being on the floor, you know, building those relationships. And there's there's a lot more that goes into college basketball, obviously, um, which is part of it. But I was like, hey, you know, between my Zooms and then in-person training, 
I was like, I, I can just do this full time. You know, what the heck? Like, I've got plenty of kids here in Northwest Indiana and up in Michigan. I'm training. Like, why not just do that full time and, and try to build it? Um, so that's really what I've started to pursue these last, you know, month and a half. So you, the Spike Albrecht ball handling workouts are, uh, they're, they're on Zoom. You do 40 minutes, $10 a session, it looks like, at least from your, your tweet here, uh, Sundays and Wednesdays. Um, I, obviously, Zoom is amazing because, I mean, it's allowed us to connect here. Um, sure. But how, how much work can you get through on Zoom? You know what? We do quite a bit, especially when it's just ball handling sessions. You know, in my big group sessions, I'll do like 30, 40 minutes and like you can crank out some serious ball handling workouts. And it's like right now, it's super easy on Zoom. It's, it's really easy for me to like coach them up and teach and explain and demonstrate. Um, you know, and then I also do, you know, one on ones or small groups for kids who want a little bit more instruction. And, you know, maybe we can get out onto a court and do some different types of moves and finishes um, when the weather's cooperating, not so much in the winter toughest region basketball player you ever went against in high school who oh, toughest region basketball player um i'm trying to think you know i played against maryville had a couple really good teams jeremiah jones brandon clark um i miss novak i was i was on jv as a freshman so i didn't get a play against i seen him he was yeah an so he so he was he was playing at chesterton the first year i started writing and yeah. he was this pudgy sophomore mm -hmm. up against the built luke herringote uh oh. Graham, and novak ate him for lunch and i thought i i mean i, I actually i you know i've I've been around VU for a long time. I reached out to one of the VU coaches and I said, Hey, you got to look at this kid. And they're like, Oh no, we we're on, we're on, we know. Yeah. And, we're aware. Uh, man that I love watching uh, Novak play. He was a lot of fun. Yeah. Just the ultimate competitor, right? Like maybe didn't have all the God given abilities that some of these other guys had, but that dude was an absolute warrior. Um, you know, and that's why he's been successful. You know, not there just are many basketball, great stories life. about Zach Novak that cannot be shared on Zoom yeah. calls. <laughs> Mo mostly all of them. He's, he's yes, mostly all of them. <laughs> uh, Spike, uh, Michigan plays Purdue. Who are you cheer for? You know what? People ask me that all the time. I'm sure. I'm sure. You know, I, I love them both. I, I don't I don't root one way or the, the other. Um, they're both really great people. I will say, not that I would, I would cheer more for Purdue, but I definitely, you know, now – um, just because Coach B is not there, I have more of a relationship with Purdue and their staff. Um, so I stay a little bit more in contact with those guys. Um, but, like, I love Juwan and, and, you know, the people that, that he's got there. They've been really great to me when I've gone back to campus. And um, so, yeah, that's a tough one. You're not getting me there. I'm no, that's fine. Uh, I, I just let, – let's end with this because Valpo is going to play Purdue. What was that experience like? I know I know that you were you were coming off the of surgery – I know that VU reached out to you. I think, I mean, at least I think from, from, I, yeah. I remember the day that, that you said you were transferring. I remember I was in the middle of a conversation with Bryce Drew and he kicked me out of his office. So I think he could call you or something yeah. like that. <laughs> but, uh, but going to Purdue and having that experience uh, with coach Painter, who I give a lot of credit to because he plays mid majors like Indiana state, mm -hmm. like, like Valpo. What yeah. was that experience like at Purdue? It was unbelievable. It was, it was a great year. Um, coach Painter is an awesome dude. He's a great guy, great coach, um, takes really good care of his players. And Purdue's unbelievable. I mean, Purdue's a basketball school. You know, I feel bad for the kids at VU. Like, Mackey's unbelievable. I don't know if you've ever been in Mackey, but the oh, atmosphere. Many times, yeah. yeah, it's absolutely electric. Um, so that was a great experience to be back in my home state, you know, finishing up my college career. I remember covering a Valpo Purdue game there when, when Bobby Rydell came off the bench. Uh, Bobby Buckets. Bobby Buckets. And I, I think he might have got that nickname against Valpo because he had like like 30, it felt like. And uh, I think yeah. he's doing radio broadcasts for them now or something. Yeah, like that. So, he is for sure. It's awesome. Spike, thank you very much. Again, uh, Spike does ball handling workouts on Zoom. Spike Albrecht Hoops at gmail.com. You should all check that out. Um, you know, I know that my ball handling is not great, so I might have to hop on at some point. So I like it. Good deal. Thank right. you. Spike, thank you very much. Take care. Yes, sir. We'll see.